The Girl Who Lived Again, Part 2 of 2, a Harry Potter fan fiction, written by E.J. Lomax, on archive of our own as Dirt Without Music, read by Grant Goodwin. Harry brought Cedric's body back to Hogwarts because he had asked her to. She didn't see Amos Diggory fall to his knees. She didn't feel Moody take her away, or hear Ginny shout her name. When the teachers came for Moody, for Barty Jr., she noticed, but only barely. She got back to her bed in the dormitory somehow. She went to sleep. She went back to Four Privet Drive. It was weeks into summer before she woke up enough to cry herself back to sleep. Ginny's letters were one of the things that kept her sane that summer. It felt like no one was listening to her. The papers were useless and Dumbledore was a warning weight on everyone else. Voldemort was back. She had seen him. He had touched her. And no one was listening. So she told Ginny about the graveyard, in rambling inches and inches of parchment. She threw things on the page. The names she had heard that they would hear in classrooms all the next year. The weight of Cedric's body, not yet cold. The ghosts who had guarded her. They were not happy letters, but Harry had never really been after happiness. Ginny wrote, for the first time, about Tom. In letters smudged a little with dirt from the apple orchard, Ginny wrote about the things he had said, or implied, or what she had realised only in retrospect. She talked about his charm, the layers that lied and then struck, the way it felt when his mind slid slowly into yours. He hated butterscotch, and feared death, and thought he was smarter than almost everyone. She called him Tom. When Harry came back to school for her fifth year, McGonagall stopped her as she got off the carriages. Harry had been dreaming of Cedric all summer, of green flashes and dry grass and cold stone. She was thinking of a war to come, though she hadn't named it that yet. She had all of Ginny's letters tucked in her book bag, and it was a welcome wait. Yes, Professor, she said, expecting bad news, expecting advice, expecting sympathy she'd just as soon trade for anything else. I've spoken to the house elves and edited the rosters to more accurately reflect the situation, McGonagall said. Harry blinked, confused, and McGonagall went on. Your luggage should be in the fifth-year girl's dorm. A new four-poster has been supplied. I expect no nonsense, Miss Potter. Harry hugged her around the middle, and McGonagall, flustered, said, It's just my job. When they met up in the hog's head to form the DA, the drab tavern filled with robes of Hogwarts black, with yellow scarves and red trim and blue mittens. As Hermione stacked her papers neatly for the eighth time, getting ready to start, the door swung open again to admit three green scarves and three pairs of flushed cheeks. Blaze smirked at the quiet room. Sorry, we're late. You're not sorry, Harry said. Blaze grinned at her as the Greengrass sisters found places to sit in the crowd. I like learning, Astoria was saying brightly, as Ginny asked the Slytherin curiously about what she was doing here. And I like Astoria not doing dumb stuff without me, said Daphne, eyeing the Weasley twins suspiciously. Blaze sidled over to Harry, who was trying not to smile. He shrugged fluidly. Melissa said she'd rather nap, and I didn't ask Pansy, he said. Thank you, said Harry. I'm not sure I'd have let you in if you'd brought Pansy. The room of requirement gave you what you needed. It gave Harry dummies for her students to practice on, gave her books and supplies and wide open space. It gave her hair ties when she needed it, to get her hair out of her face. Neville tried hardest of all of them. Fred and George badgered Ginny into showing off her bat bogey hex. Astoria Greengrass and Susan Bones were poor students, always off in the corner getting distracted by fervent discussions of the minute details of magical law enforcement. Daphne looked on, bemused and uncomfortable, while Blaze took quickly to flirting with Marietta and Lavender, sending them off into fits of giggles. When Harry went out to the greenhouses these days, Neville was there sometimes, or Hannah Abbott. They didn't talk, just passed shears and water cans between each other. They didn't ask about the DA schedule, or Umbridge's latest edicts, or how each of them got here, as after-hours movement grew more and more restricted. Sprout gave them projects and gentle advice, sandwiches and iced tea. My grandmother immigrated from Virginia, ages back. Yes, it's rather sweet, isn't it? Good for the heat in here. Umbridge confiscated Harry, Fred and George's brooms, and kicked them off the team. Ginny took Harry's place on the team, though Harry knew from years of summer letters that Ginny would have preferred Chaser to seek her any day. 
Blaze sat with Harry for the first game her team played without her, wrapped up in his green scarf and clapping with polite boredom for any goal, regardless of team. Ginny's hair was a fiery tail behind her as she bent close over her broom and dove after a flash of fluttering gold. She really is quite pretty, Blaze said. Uh, said Harry. She... she flies good. Blaze slanted a glance over at her, and Harry kept her eyes fixed on the field. I'm really not your type, am I? he said. That's... that's not what I... said Harry. She's Ron's sister. Yeah, said Blaze, and she really is quite pretty. He patted Harry on the shoulder. As winter moved to spring that year, Luna took her out to the forest and showed her the thestrals. They went walking with raw cuts of meat in their hands, and Harry remembered nursing black eyes back in her cupboard. Sometimes I'm not a girl, Luna said casually, in the middle of talking about invisible head-circling mites and what might be on for dessert at supper. You know, things just change. Sometimes. Sometimes I'm not anything. Harry was frowning and Luna turned and smiled at her. I don't think it's like that with you. You don't change much. Don't I? said Harry, tucking her hair behind her ears. I don't think so, said Luna. I think you're just you, but you tell me. Harry thought about her cupboard again, as they rode the thestrals over a London light to the ministry. She thought about all the little wounds she had nursed there, in that cobwebbed darkness. She thought about what pains she would be willing to carry to have a home to go to that loved her as much as her godfather did. She had once regrown all the bones of her arm. She had gone down under the Dementors, their hoods falling back as they stepped in close. She had felt every centimetre of her skin break open under Wormtail's knife, tied up in that graveyard, Cedric's body a lump in the dark. She knew about pain. She could cast her Patronus anywhere. Ron and Ginny stomped through the ministry halls, hair bright, and Harry remembered visions of Arthur bleeding out on this tile. Hermione's hair was a cloud, Luna's a slant of moonlight, Neville's earth. Harry had been to the greenhouses so much less this year, spending so many spare moments in the room, nurturing people instead of plants. She was tired, she thought she might always be this tired, and this scared. A blight, a mould, a dying limb, browning leaves. None of them left that night unscathed. None of them would hate her when they woke up the next morning, aching, and they would wake up the next morning. They had gone to save Sirius, and Sirius wasn't there. But he came, wand out, hair wild. He was young. He would always be young. She would spend more of her life remembering him than knowing him. A flash of green. Sirius went backward through the veil, and Harry watched him go. It's silly, she wrote to Ginny that summer, curled up in the hedge when no one could find her but I really thought that one of these days he was going to come take me away. I thought I'd hear the motorbike coming down the street. You know Hagrid brought me here on that motorbike? All the neighbours would come to their windows and stare, because no one has motorbikes in Privet Drive. And I would know it was for me, and open the door, and he'd say, Get your things, kiddo, and no one would be able to stop us. Do you want me to borrow Dad's car? Ginny wrote back. Just say the word. The next year, Voldemort was still back but this time people believed her. The year went slow. She flew through potions with the help of a textbook that Hermione didn't trust. Neither did Ginny. It just makes me nervous, Ginny said. Books with personality. You know. Oh, said Harry. Just be careful. Ron started dating Lavender, loudly, and that made for an awkward sixth-year girl's dormitory. Pavati kept saying pointed things about Hermione's aura, while Hermione snapped back about pseudo-magic. Harry practiced her silencios. They didn't fight much when she was trying to sleep, but she was still having nightmares. Dumbledore had been telling her bedtime stories about the Gaunts, about young Tom, and the pieces of his soul. Harry had faced Voldemort now, more times than almost anyone else had, and lived. She was sixteen years old, and she was tired. The next time Blaze tracked her down, planning to laze about the lake with a bag of sweets from his mother, Harry sat quietly on the green grass for a long time. Blaze filled the silence easily, but she could feel him keeping an eye on her. Why did you come up to me? Harry said eventually. Blaze stopped hypothesizing about the giant squid's intelligence level. You're friends with Draco and his lot, Harry said. I know you are. Your family. They're not on my side of the war, are they? This is school, said Blaze. Not war. 
Schoolyard taunts. It's not that big of a line to step over. Yes, it is, said Harry. Why did you? Blaze tipped his head back, leaning on his elbows. When he stood up, his robes wouldn't be a touch grass-stained. It's about sticking with your people, right? Packs. Clicks. No, that's not quite what I mean. His voice had gone soft. Thoughtful. A Hufflepuff girl did this for me once. Nymphadora. She... He shook his head. She didn't have to. And Madame Pomfrey talked about, you know, paying it back. You get, and you give back. That's not it. I know it's not. Let me finish. He tipped his head back further, not looking at her. I'm not kind. She was kind. You also are not kind. But you're good, and I am not good. But you're my people. I have been where you are, or something like it. There are things about me that Millicent and Daphne are never going to quite understand. But I recognize me in you, and that means something to me. You're very strange, said Harry. Blaze smiled, dropping his chin. You'll meet my mother some day. You'll understand. She thought about taking Blaze to Slughorn's dinner party, but for all they were friends, they were still friends quietly. She asked Luna and beamed when Luna offered to lend her some earrings so they could be matching. Harry thought later that she should have known Dumbledore didn't plan on coming back from that rock in the sea. There was something in the way he stood, maybe, or the way he smiled at her. Those crescent moon glasses, that long nose, the way he had been dropping stories in her hands all year and making her carry them. But she didn't know, when he asked her to come with him, when they apparated out, when the salt wind struck her in the face with a cold slap. He told her her blood was more precious than his, and she still thought he wanted to be okay. He drank from the poisoned water, and she still thought he was going to come home. On the astronomy tower, Harry, frozen under their feet, Dumbledore begged Snape, not for his life, but his death. But Harry didn't know that then. Dumbledore did. Snape did. Harry ran down the lawn after him, lit by fire and magic, hoarse with grief. Her hair was long. Her eyes were green and furious. When Snape looked at her, he saw Lily. I am not a coward, Severus said, and Harry screamed in his face. They buried Dumbledore. Harry had never been to a funeral before. They hadn't been one for Sirius. Before they left for the Horcrux hunt, before Ginny and Neville and Luna and Blaze boarded a train back to Hogwarts, there was a celebration. Bill Weasley, partial werewolf, married Fleur, part blood Vila. Their kids are going to be so pretty and eat so much rare steak, Hermione said thoughtfully. Luna came in a yellow dress. It's lucky, she told Harry, and Harry resisted the urge to say, good, they might need it. Fleur was luminescent. Harry was not surprised, but she skirted the edge of the happy, anxious crowd. She brushed her palms down the dress Blaze had taken her out to find, which was a green just a shade darker than her eyes. Maybe that was a lucky colour too. Maybe she just looked good, standing here with her hair all brushed out and loose, and that felt nice in the middle of all of this. She stayed on the edge of the tent, watching Luna and her father waggle their arms and turn in circles, watching Bill beam in Flo's direction without stopping, his scars creasing. Ginny came over with her bridesmaid skirts all bunched up in her hands and bumped Harry's shoulder. You look pretty, Harry said. I hate skirts, Ginny said, dropping the fabric with a grimace. You look lovely. I like the green. Want to dance? All that year, Harry wrote Ginny from the road. They didn't kiss at the wedding, but Harry thought about it. She thought about the way their hands touched, dancing, and how close Ginny was standing. She thought about what it might be like after the wedding, as people put out the candles and took down the tents, as they walked home. She thought about taking Ginny's hand in hers, slowing their stride so everyone moved ahead, and left them under the quiet sky, starlit, what it might be like to turn and tip her chin up a little and lean in. But the wedding ended in warnings, a scattering to the winds. Hermione grabbed Harry's hand and Ron's. Their quest began. And so here Harry was, curled up in their tent while Ron fiddled with the radio, and Hermione inventoried her bag of plenty. Harry scratched out letters she couldn't send, talking about the rocks they slept on, about Ron's hunching shoulders, she and Hermione braiding each other's hair, the landscapes Harry had never seen before, how tired she was of prepackaged pumpkin pasties, how bright the stars were this far from human lights. She wrote, I think I would have tried to kiss you, 
after the wedding, I like to think I would have been brave enough. She had no way to send them, so she didn't. R.A.B. Regulus Black had died in the name of Voldemort's death. Harry turned the locket over and over in her hand, once they'd freed it from Umbridge's ownership. So had Dumbledore. Her parents had died for her life. She thought, if it came to it, that she would die to stop Tom Riddle, but she'd rather live for the people left behind than die for them. Before she had left Hogwarts for the burrow, and then this long, cold road, she and Blaze had gone to sit out beside the lake. She had told him, the hat offered me Slytherin, and he had laughed. See, he'd said, I told you you were one of mine. Blaze did not sit with Dumbledore's army on the express back to Hogwarts. He shared a compartment with Daphne and a displeased Astoria, who had wanted to sit with Susan. She got to sit in on some Wizengamot sessions this summer, Astoria said. She was going to tell me all about it. Blaze watched one of the Carrow twins pace the corridor outside and said, We don't want them to see us friendly with troublemakers. But we are friends, said Astoria. And good friends take care of each other, said Blaze. Let's be good. Snape, as headmaster, was rarely seen. Electo and Amicus Caro ran the school. It was the smallest first-year class Hogwarts had seen since the height of the First Wizarding War. Defense Against was taken off the class title of Defense Against the Dark Arts. Hannah Abbott and Anthony Goldstein took charge of the first years, learning every name and nightmare, checking in with chocolate and comfort, and deciding which ones needed to be disappeared. Neville and Ginny were hiding in the room of requirement before the first month was out, and they took in the kids who needed it. Susan Bones and Justin Finch Fletchley were the best at lying low, playing nice, and so they stayed out in the open the longest, excepting all the Slytherins but Astoria, who went into hiding around month two, after she cursed Electo for making a third year cry. Blaze smiled and flattered and made Amicus laugh. He passed on what secrets he learned, stole what supplies he could, and slipped laxatives into the Death Eater's tea. Sequestered in the room, busy setting traps and causing trouble, Neville and Hannah couldn't make it out to Sprout's greenhouses. A new doorway opened off the room the first time Neville buried his hands in his hair and tugged hard enough to hurt. Inside were pots of dark soil, benches of tools, packets of seeds. Every wall was windows, even the one that led back to the main room. They were cloudy and impossible to see through, but the sunlight streamed in and the air steamed. Blaze did not sleep one night in the room of requirement. He played chess in the Slytherin common room with purebloods who thought Hogwarts was finally getting its act together. He recognised their sneers, and it was easy to copy the tilts of their smug chins. He did not sleep one night in the room, but he snuck out of his dormitory to spend many sleepless nights there, poring over shifting maps of Hogwarts, advising on traps and enemy positions, and timing, the things he'd heard them planning. Susan Bones took notes and caught shorthand. Ginny listened close and drew up their battle plans. Blaze told the younger kids bedtime stories, the ones his mother had told him, the ones where the clever little kid always, always wins. He got back to his bed before sunrise, most of the nights that he did that, and slept through History of Magic, but that honestly wasn't new. Out on the road, Ron left, and came back, and struck the locket down in the forest with the sword of a true Gryffindor. Hermione pulled miracles from her bag. Bellatrix Lestrange wrote mudblood into her arm. They found Luna, and lost Dobby, and then they went home. When Harry came back to Hogwarts, she had a messy bundle of letters tied together in the bottom of her bag. She had a destroyed locket, a cup, and an idea where the diadem might be. Voldemort's ultimatum hanging over all their heads. Pansy Parkinson gave up Harry Potter in the Great Hall, her finger pointing, her hands shaking. Why not, Pansy said. Just give him Potter. Gryffindor raised their wands on her, then Hufflepuff, then Ravenclaw. Their backs were to Harry, black robe shoulders like shields. The school decided to fight, and McGonagall told Slytherin House to go wait in the dungeons for it all to be over. Blaze was turning his wand idly in his hand, eyes slanted down. Astoria rose up on her tiptoes in outrage, but it was Susan Bones who stepped forward. No, Professor, Susan said, and McGonagall's brows furrowed. They're a part of this fight too. Daphne pulled out of the crowd to stand by Astoria's shoulder. Hannah Abbott stepped over, then Anthony Goldstein, the Creevy brothers, and Seamus in his singed eyebrows. We'll send the others out one of the passengers, Susan said, to Hogsmeade, 
somewhere safer than here, if they don't want to fight with us. Anyone, from any house, who's afraid to stay, we'll send them. McGonagall raised the statues and protections with Flitwick, while Slughorn escorted first and second years, some scattered other students, and the bulk of Slytherin House out the tunnels to Hogsmeade. Blaze stretched out his wrists, while Astoria and Susan sat with their shoulders pressed warm together, waiting. Harry had a diadem to find, and Hermione and Ron a bag of basilisk fangs to hunt down. Ginny had a small army to marshal, but Harry hesitated beside where Ginny was tying her hair back and arguing with Seamus about explosives. Hey, um, said Harry. Seamus glanced between them and then headed off, calling something acquiescing over his shoulder. Hey, said Ginny. All around them, the hall was a flurry of preparation, fluxing around small, quiet pockets of people touching each other, saying good luck and maybe goodbye. Harry dug through her bag until she found a stack of folded papers at the bottom, tied with twine. Ah, she said. I couldn't send them, but... And she pushed the letters in Ginny's direction. Ginny, smiling, took them with one freckled hand, but she reached out her other, touched Harry's jaw, and kissed her. I wrote you too, she said, when she pulled back. But I don't have them on me, you sap. I'm carrying everything I own, Harry protested. I've been camping for months. I don't have them on me, Ginny repeated. I'll give them to you later. So you make sure there's a later, okay? Harry smiled. She didn't know yet about Snape's last story, about the pieces of soul that lived quietly in her marrow. She didn't know her death would be the cost of Ginny's life, so she said, I'll do my best. Daphne and Astoria got separated in the first half hour of the fight, holding a fiercely contested corridor with flung curses. They saw a trio of robed figures heading for the back of a pack of Ravenclaws. You go, said Daphne. I'll guard your back. Professor Sprout rose, grasping, suffocating weeds out of the stones of the maid courtyard, Neville and Hannah guarding her back. Out in that mess of crushed greenery, Colin Creevy took down three Death Eaters and then took an Abadur cadaver to the chest. Fred died laughing. Tonks and Lupin went within moments of each other. Pavati and Professor Trelawney carried Lavender's body back to the hall. Harry watched Snape die out in the boat shed, ugly and drawn out and painful. She learned about where the last piece of Voldemort's soul was hiding, unknown even to him. There was a choice here, but she could only see one answer she could live with. Well, not live with, or at least not for very long. She wrapped herself in the cloak, like she had at thirteen, looking for peace in empty spaces and invisibility. The greenhouses were dark shapes in the night, making the stars behind them go wavery as their light moved through warped glass. Under the bowed limbs of the trees, she turned the stone over three times. Ghostly figures rose into view, the family she might have had in a kinder life. James smiled. Sirius looked tall and clean and rested, and still far too old for the bare three decades he had lived. Harry had seen Lupin just a few hours before. Harry had seen Lupin just moments before she had pulled on her cloak and walked out to die, his body on the great hall floor, beside Tonks. Lily's ghost reached out and touched Harry's cheek, as though she'd like to push her hair back out of her face. You're beautiful, she said. We are so proud of you. Harry couldn't feel her mother's fingers on her cheek, but she could see her mother's trembling, translucent smile. Warm hands had touched her cheek over the years. It wasn't like knowing her mother. Not the sunlight of Professor Sprout's greenhouses, or the full plates at Molly's. But she knew what this touch was supposed to feel like, and that was something. That was hers. Sirius, kneeling in a cave outside Hogsmeade, pushing the hair out of her eyes and telling her her parents loved her. Mum, I'm scared, she said. Were you scared? I'm sorry. You died so I could live, and I can't. I'm so sorry, I can't. Of course I was scared, baby, she said. But it was worth it. Everything you have done. Everything you have been. Harry wanted her mother to squeeze her hands, tight and comforting, so she squeezed her own. She closed her eyes tight. Now you have to be brave, just one more time. When Harry opened her eyes, they were gone. She didn't draw her wand, when she stepped into the clearing to face the shell of Tom Riddle. She tried not to be afraid. There was a flash of green light, and then she woke up in a King's Cross station that was too clean to be true. She was given a choice to go forward, or to go back. There will be people who love you, waiting there for you, said Dumbledore, smiling 
sitting on a bench bathed in light. It will be easy, and so little has been easy for you. But Harry had people who loved her, waiting back at Hogwarts too. She was tired, but they were waiting. Ron and Hermione, who had come so far for her. Blaze, who said he wasn't kind. She had months of Ginny's letters to read. She had made a promise. Harry woke up cheek down in forest mulch. Narcissa lied for her. Neville pulled the sword from the hat and took down the snake. Harry killed Voldemort in a flash of green light, and his body hit the ground with an ugly thud. After the war, Harry planted beds of flowers around the burrow. She chose plants and charmed them, so that there would be something blooming in every season. She joined the auras and slept a lot of nights on the pull-out couch in Hermione and Ginny's little apartment outside the local wizarding college. Hermione was taking a double class load, no time turner, just good scheduling, and Ginny was playing for the school Quidditch team and dazzling scouts. Other nights, Harry spent in one of Blaze's lovely spare rooms, until she finally found her own little place to stay. Her flat wasn't much bigger than a cupboard under some stairs, but she liked it. She made friends with the spiders under the sink, and the little snakes who lived in the lot out back. Neville took over for Professor Sprout, who sent Harry postcards and plant clippings from her retirement world tour. Ginny moved out of Hermione's the week Ron moved in, saying she was about as close with her brother and future sister-in-law. What? squeaked Ron, as she was comfortable being. Blaze rolled his eyes over drinks one night, as Ginny complained about bad water pressure in her new place and said he was getting rid of the hat collection that was taking up one of his spare rooms. Harry stirred her drink idly, and Blaze added, sighing at their inability to take a hint, that he'd been thinking of letting the room out. You can even move your spiders in, he told Harry. You know, he added to Ginny, conspiratorially and commiserating, I had to tell her you were pretty, and I think she only noticed because you were on a broom. Seems about right, said Ginny brightly. I think I'll keep her. When the Auras started talking about promotions and bigger office spaces, Harry hesitated. She went home to the room they'd rid of Blaze's fancy heirloom furniture and filled with wobbly-legged Weasley exports and Molly's quilts. Harry laid her head on Ginny's lap and got dripped on by her hair, freshly washed after Quidditch practice. I don't think I want to keep doing this, said Harry. You don't have to, said Ginny. Hey, I hear the cannons need a seeker, if you don't mind us beating you in every match. Harry laughed. You fought for most of your life, said Ginny, and you're good at it, but it's not because you like it. Harry thought about the things in her life that she had loved, and not just lived through, and then she sent an application in to Hogwarts for a teaching position. Blaze's bathroom taps were hilariously ornate, and Harry always made sure to talk to the little snakes carved into them, to see if any would open up something unexpected. His didn't, but when they visited Astoria and Daphne, she found a secret tunnel out to the woodshed that opened to Parseltongue. There was a poker in Blaze's living room, though, that had a little sculpted snake that would tell you riddles if you asked nice, and in its own tongue. One night, when Hermione, with Harry's translation help and Ron's emotional support, was jousting with the riddling thing, Harry wrote a letter to Sprout, asking for advice. Everyone needs something, Professor Sprout wrote back, cramped, on a postcard from the Galapagos Islands. You won't be the answer for every kid, but look for the ones you can help. Offer them what you have, but they're the only ones who can take it. Be an ear, be a kindness, be safe. You can't help them all, but you can save some. On Harry's second, first day at Hogwarts, she had the Marauder's Map folded in her pocket. Blaze had picked out her earrings, Ginny had stuffed a muffin in her hand, kissed her goodbye, and pushed her out the door. Hermione had been quizzing her on the curriculum standards for weeks. A half hour before her students were supposed to arrive, Harry climbed up to the defence against the dark arts classroom. Morning light poured through the window, washing over the desks and bookshelves, the stone walls, the young woman in dark robes who was squeezing her hands together. Harry breathed. She went to the desk and sat down to her notes, which were stained with Hermione's annotations and the bottom of Ginny's favourite mug. Out the window she could see the tops of the Forbidden Forest's tallest trees, waving in a wind that didn't touch her. It felt like home. She meant to stay. All curses end in time. The scar on her forehead hadn't ached in years, and it never would again. This has been a reading of a fanfiction creation by E.J. Lomax, with music by Maiden. Maiden.